I'm Scott Allen Miller. It's the 24th of November 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Latin America. We're still in La Paz, Bolivia today. And like I mentioned on yesterday's show, if you watch that, you know that today we're going to be exploring the Teleferico. This is the public transportation system that is used here in La Paz. Being a city high in the Andean Mountains, it is a real challenge to move people around the city because traffic is difficult. Buses have a hard time making it up the hills. There's places where cars can't go and certainly trains are not a possibility. So cities like this have to do something alternative. And here, the cable cars or Teleferico are the way that they've tackled this. They did this about 20 years ago, and it has been a monument to urban planning. And so today, my friend Marcelo and I are going out to explore a couple of the lines and head down to the south part of the city. And I'm going to take you guys along for the ride. <laughs> Actually picking up from where we were on yesterday's episode. This is us entering El Prado Terminal. This is the end of the blue line here for the Teleferico in La Paz, Bolivia. This is one of the coolest public transportation works you will ever discover. It is so neat. Now, La Paz is the highest city in the world, or the La Paz metro area, at least is the highest city in the world. And it's always been challenged with uh, how to make public transportation available in a city that is so vertical. And it, uh, you, know, you can't have trains. You can't have uh, buses in a lot of cases. You have this really uh, challenging terrain. And it's a very large city that sprawls over a great distance. And so how do they handle it? These uh, cable cars going over the city turn out to be absolutely fantastic. They play the role that a subway normally would, and it may seem like their volume is, is much lower, and in some ways it is, but something you don't realize until you've ridden a Teleferico is that they move continuously. A subway, you have to wait for a train to come, and then it fills up, maybe it's already full, and then it moves on, and uh, it, it feels like a lot of people moving at once, but in reality, it is, but there's a big gap, often five minutes or 20 minutes in between trains. With a teleferico, there's a new one every 30 seconds. And so you're just constantly able to load six to eight people into one of these. And whether you're just one person uh, or a group, it's really quick to get in. And it's very rare that they're going to be full just because of the way that they work. And so there's a lot of opportunity to just keep people moving. So sometimes you'll see long lines, but the lines get eaten through really quickly and it works incredibly well. All right, so we're here in the Teleferico and we're coming from El Prado. We're heading over the park that I walked in the other day. So I'm gonna, ooh, it's hard to stand up in this. It's a song alarm. Okay. Oh, they don't let you stand up. <laughs> yeah. So this is the park that I walked through. This type of system makes it really easy to move people around in a very low latency way. Meaning if you only have one or two people riding on the system, you don't have to wait for a train to come. They're able to get right through the line, get straight onto one of the cars and move on to their destination. Whereas with a subway, you're stuck waiting on average, maybe 10 minutes for the next train to come. So there's a lot of advantages to this system, even at the same uh, capacity that a subway would handle. But the views on this, I mean, this is fantastic. And that's Marcelo there you get to go above the city and look down on so many neighborhoods and so many different parts. And that's the park that I walked uh, a couple of days ago on the show. It was the morning that I actually filmed this. I did three days of filming uh, worth on this one particular day. And the apartment that I stayed at is just off to the right. You can't see it, but it's, it's pretty uh, sharply off to the right there. This is the beginning or the north end of the blue line. We're heading towards the southern hills and you can see them way down there. And off in the distance, you can actually see snow-capped mountains. And if you hear that sound in the background, that is my absolutely insane dogs who every time I'm talking on the show in my office decide that they have to play or bark or something at that particular moment and there's no way around it. Uh, but my favorite, I mean, obviously, the best part of the Teleferico 
well, is probably that it makes the entire city accessible to so many people. But as a tourist, taking the Teleferico means you get to see the entire city from the most amazing vantage points for hardly anything. The cost of riding this is ridiculously low. In many cases, just one or two dollars to go to a reasonable point. And if you want to take a tour of the entire city, it might be 10 to 15 dollars. Like this is really affordable. And when I say 10 to 15 dollars, I'm talking about riding for hours at a time. There's a total of 10 main lines that are on this. This is not just one, and I, this is what I thought before I got to the city. I thought this was one line that ran through the city, but it's not. There's lines that go all over in a giant ring with connecting lines going in between and more being built currently. This is a massive system, and these stations that you come into are really large as well. Another advantage of Telefericos is that they're incredibly safe. They're safe to operate. They're safe for long-term usage. They're safe for people to ride. Like, the entire mechanism works really well. One downside, and obviously there's no getting around this, the windows are often dirty or a little bit scratched. These work so incredibly well, and they're so cheap. One downside is quite often the windows are dirty or even scratched, and it makes it a little bit difficult to film out of it. We're not here with a film crew and able to attach a camera to the outside of the of the gondola, so unfortunately we're stuck with what we have here. But it still looks pretty good, and it really gives you an idea of just how good this looks. It's so much fun to ride and see out the windows and just see the entire city pass below you. Plus, it's fun to ride, right? Unless you're afraid of heights, this is, it's to me, it feels a lot like a, a Disney World ride. One of the things that's amazing on this line is that each line can move between three and 4,000 people per direction every hour. That's a lot. If you can move 4,000 people in one direction on, say, the blue line, that's in one direction. You can move 4,000 in the other direction. Of course, during rush hour, you tend to only go one direction primarily. But in theory, you can move up to 8,000 people on each line each hour. That's a lot of people moving around the city. And we found that the entire time we used it over a period of days, it was always that you could walk straight on. There was really no waiting. Now, for me, when I used to go to Disney World, one of my favorite things is riding systems like this. I love amazing public transportation of this nature. And it's funny, growing up in Western New York, we really didn't have public transportation of any sort uh, other than buses, which no one ever took. And when we would go to places like Disney World, one of the things that's amazing is public uh, transportation infrastructure of this nature. It was a place where you got to see it, where you wouldn't get to see it in normal life because so little of the United States has any meaningful public transportation outside of the largest city and mostly with trains. But here in La Paz, getting to ride this is like Disney World on steroids. It is the most amazing ride. The views are so high and the ride goes for so long. And it actually takes you places that you want to go. So using it to take you to a restaurant or shopping or whatever is so easy and effective. And that's, of course, what it's designed for. Uh, it is an amazing addition to the city. The, the Teleferico has been in place for quite some time. It was actually put in uh, nearly 20 years ago uh, with uh, operation. So it took quite a bit of time to put it in. It's been operating for nine years. We're coming up on 10 years here very quickly. And it's listed along with Medellin uh, commonly over the last decade as being some of the best urban planning uh, going on on the planet. Both of these cities, both high in the Andes and not that far away from each other in the relative sense. They're not exactly close. Um, because of their amazing public transportation and the work that they did to transform their cities through these very green, very safety conscious, very uh, public minded works um, got a lot of international recognition for urban planning and development because this really did uh, completely change the city. And, and this line that we're riding, which is the blue line at the moment, if you're going to look at a map, this one heads kind of mostly east. It's southeast. And as it goes it eventually um, connects to the green line. If you take the green line, which we're going to do, that's gonna take you to the southern edge of the city. And in doing that, there's something very important, and that is that much of the city that you see has grown up, has existed only since the implementation of the Teleferico. Now, of course, this section where the blue line comes through is the very heart of the old city. So this part has been there. But when we get to the green line, much of that, I'm told, did not exist 
Of course, some houses exist, right? Some things were there, but there was very small populations that were very isolated living at what is now along the Green Line. And that is because they are very far to the south. The distance to get into the middle of the city was extremely far. And they were isolated by really high mountains because we're very high in the Andes. The, the base level here is about 12,000 feet. And these peaks that you see on our sides go up as much as 2,000 feet additionally. And so having a mountain in the way often meant that cars had very little way to get through. And if they did, there were great bottlenecks and it could take a very long time to pass through. So that made the, the southern sections of the city or really the eastern sections of the city, I think is a better way to, to think of it, uh, very inaccessible, very hard to get out to. Once the green line was put in, that section of what would become the city that was originally kind of an isolated area uh, suddenly flourished and became a really important part of the city and grew up and became another downtown with lots of high rises and its own enormous shopping areas and residential and retail and everything has grown up in, in this really recent time period, as well as El Alto, the city, sort of the barrio above La Paz, has just exploded as the cable cars allow you to go up there with ease. And suddenly, instead of being totally isolated or, or heavily cut off from the main city of La Paz down below, it has become very accessible and very easy for people to move in between. Even though it may take quite a bit of time, it's very easy to jump on a very low-cost teleferico, uh, teleferico and ride in between them uh, in, with these great views uh, at pretty much any time. It is a game changer for the city and has allowed it to expand in a, in a really amazing way. It is so much larger than it was just 10 years ago. And uh, that accounts a lot for why uh, continuing, there is so much development going into the Teleferico because it, it is a part of the ongoing uh, development and growth of the city and the strategy of how the city is going to remain um, in a position of being able to grow. Because without the Teleferico, it is just the communities are too isolated from each other and it, it would be a very different experience. And so it's it's so neat. I do wish I would have had a chance to visit the city 20 years ago and see what it was like and see how this firsthand has transformed the city because this is this is just fantastic. And, and like it's so neat to see so much of the city. So I hope you guys are enjoying these views because this is really cool. I'm really glad that I got a chance to go out and do this. Uh, we were just out walking around, and you can watch the last two days of episodes to get a feel for where we were and what we were doing. And uh, Marcelo's like, well, do you want to ride the Teleferico? We're going to ride it tomorrow, but we could ride some now and go see some parts of the city. And I'm like, yeah, I've always wanted to do this. Like, it's such a big thing. And uh, so... We just hopped on and uh, and did a quick ride um, and, and just all of this. You get such a better feel for the city, the distance between things and the terrain and the challenges of La Paz uh, by doing this. It really is amazing. You can see my reflection a little bit there holding the camera. Uh, it's unfortunate that the windows are so dirty. It would be so great uh, to be able to work with the city and be allowed to mount cameras on the outside and just get the most aesthetic astounding views. Um, but that's uh, it potentially for another time. Um, I would love to put a 360 camera on one of these, dangle it from the bottom and get the views all across the city. But uh, we'll have to get a lot bigger show. So tell your friends and family, get people to subscribe and watch more episodes. Maybe we'll get there, get enough attention that cities want to uh, do that stuff with us. But uh, there you can see the river down below a little bit. There's a couple different rivers that flow through. This is so high in the mountains. It's just wild. How, how far up this is. Everything in La Paz is pretty amazing. Um, being the world's highest city, it just feels so different than, than anywhere else um, ever will, realistically. Overall, it was a, it was a really good day. Um, and, and I feel like even just on a single day of being here in La Paz, I have such a good idea of, of what it's like because I got to walk around a lot um, this day turned out to be a fantastic day. I'd set this entire day aside uh, for my adjustment to the altitude. And you can see, okay, so as we're coming into this station, off to the right, you can see the yellow line coming into the building behind. So this is a shared terminal. This is where if you were going to transfer from blue to yellow, you would do that 
here. And we got out, but not because we're transferring to yellow, we're actually transferring to green. You can see uh, exiting to the yellow and green line written there above. The yellow line goes off to the right, which is kind of to the west at this point, I believe, is the best way to, none of it goes in a straight line, right? It's a little bit difficult to give directions. But Marcelo and I walked out and, and it's great, right? You just come into these stations and it's a very easy walk. You can see how empty they are. Beautiful hallway. Sometimes you have to go over the road uh, to transfer between different places. And uh, all of this so well done. The one thing I really wish they did have is if we were in Europe, and these are train stations, which of course are, it's a different place and, and different things, but they would have these stations full of vendors and there'd be coffee shops and restaurants and maybe little mini marts with groceries and stuff inside these stations. And these stations are just empty. There's, you know, great places to sit and nice, comfortable open room and lots of light and open air, but they're just so empty. Now there's a shop there, as I say that, but it's closed and it's a tiny little shop of like uh, knickknacks. It's, it's just really minor. Um, I wish that it was a lot more bustling and full of interesting options. Some of the stations do have cool options that are outside. This is us figuring out our cards to go through and making sure we're on the right one. So you can get a regular card. It's kind of like a credit card that you charge up and it lets you go through. Uh, or you can get one-time uh, paper passes that have a QR code on them and you just scan them. And you'll notice that the stations you're in, the building inside and out is painted in the color bricks of the line you're at. So we went to the end of the blue line. You saw us get out at the blue station. You can see the yellow station, all yellow on the outside. You also see the, the gondolas going between them are also the color of the station. Once in a while they're not, that's a little bit confusing. Confusing, but they're generally all matched and then we went into this green building and there you can see the yellow line is on the one side green line is on the other everything is so color coordinated of course I'm colorblind so it's not a great way for me to keep track of what's going on but uh, if you can see colors it is it is very straightforward to know which line you're getting on which one you are currently on where you're going and so forth so, and you can see they're very slow. If you're worried about these, remember this is public transportation. It's meant to be easy and accessible for everybody. And it truly is. They come by extremely slowly and you just walk right on. They sway just a little bit. It's not bad at all. You sit down. Uh, you cannot walk around while you're riding on the gondola. There are cameras in them and they have uh, motion sensors. So if you rock it back and forth by walking around, it'll set off alarms. They can see you walking around and they'll be like, sit down and they'll stop it if they have to. Uh, but so very, very safe. And even if you were to get pushed off, there's a net there to catch you. Like there's, there's a lot. At no point did I feel like this was risky or dangerous or anything. Um, and very easy for people who were with walkers or crutches or elderly or children. And then as you go out, it accelerates fast. All of a sudden you just take off and it rocks back and forth and you feel like you're being shot up a little bit. Of course, you can see how slowly they're going. At no point are you really being shot out, but it does feel like you're being launched just a little bit. So this is now obviously the green line. So this is the current southeastern most line of the city. There is work being done on the Dorado line, the golden line that's going to go out from there. You can see now we have people in our cabin with us. I'm looking around a bit uh, because we are coming uh, or starting to come through the neighborhood where Marcelo actually lives. Uh, so he's he's busily showing me like, ah, oh, this is where I play soccer. This is where I live, blah, blah, blah. It was, uh, it was very cool. You can tell that the city changes, right? Um, back in on the blue line, everything was very old. And here on the green line, you can tell that the houses are much newer. And of course, they have lots of challenges. Everything is built on hillsides. And it's so cool doing the teleferico because you're so high that even these houses that look down on the entire city, we're up above them. And that's, that's really neat. Um, it's it, it, like there you can see people's uh, third floor yards outdoors and stuff. And here we are above a, an eight story building and coming past what I believe is the Olympic uh, swimming pool auditorium there on the left. I don't think we get a really good view of it. And you can tell we've been riding for a long time and there's still high rises going through the middle of the valley where things are a lot more stable and, and the bedrock is deeper. 
is a very vertical city uh, and with a lot of population, but the mountains make it that there's a value to building really high in the middle of the city. But even up on the mountains where we are here quite high, they're still building quite vertically uh, just because there, there needs to be a lot of density of people. So this is, this is a city with physical challenges for sure. It has very little air. It has very little space. What space it has is not flat in any way. It is very difficult to have roads. It's impossible to have trains. It's difficult to ship things in from other areas. Everything has to come in by truck. That is definitely the swimming pool over there. That is the nonatorium from the Olympics. <clears throat> See, these are a lot of very nice, much more modern neighborhoods out here. And uh, La Paz is, to the best of my knowledge, the most expensive city in Bolivia, but still not expensive, especially for uh, rents. It's, it's quite reasonable for very modern places. Of course, here in Nicaragua, we tend towards here, I say while I'm recording this, uh, this voiceover, uh, we tend to have um, less expensive housing, but we sacrifice modernity in order to have that. And so uh, typically, with, with pretty rare exception here in Nicaragua, while housing is outrageously affordable, uh, it is also very basic um, and anything but new and flashy. And that's one of the things that drives my daughters to be so interested in moving to one of the neighboring cities because they have uh, much more modern housing and apartment options, things that are just a lot more uh, tuned towards global youth, whereas in Nicaragua it tends to be uh, much more traditional housing, which, which obviously saves you a lot of money, uh, but it does, um, it does not satisfy everyone's, everyone's needs. Here in Bolivia, we found that there was an awful lot of, of relatively modern housing and that uh, everywhere we went, the apartments and houses were, um, of course, there's, there's older stuff as well, but there is a lot that was built more recently and a lot that has a much more modern design. Even if the buildings were older, they put a lot of effort into making it look like a more modern urban environment, uh, more like what we would expect really in like uh, where I'm from, in like downtown Dallas. When I lived in Texas, living out in Carrollton where we were, very little was modern. When we had uh, apartment complexes, even if they were new, they tended to be of a style that wasn't super modern. It didn't give you that, I live in an up and coming downtown area kind of feel. But when you went to closer to downtown Dallas, you would get these more high risey sort of super modern apartments. And Bolivia, from what we experienced, gave us a lot more feel of that every Everywhere that we went than uh, we really see in the United States, uh, let alone in Nicaragua where we really don't uh, see it at all. So we're continuing to come through. You'll notice that we're coming over really high ridges and there's those like high rises off to the right are far below us. So the, the distance between really just a few streets away is extreme. And if it wasn't for things like the Teleferico, getting between them would be extremely difficult and, and isolate those communities. And you can see how far it sprawls out there uh, to kind of the east, a little bit to the north as we look over. It's, it's so cool to know that this is now all being connected in these, these communities that for uh, forever have been uh, so separate from each other are now just all one and people are going back and forth uh, in this really interesting way. It's all, it's really incredible. I, so impressed by uh, the entire system and how it works and, and how the city is growing. It is a, it is a lot of fun uh, to get to explore as a city. Compared to most cities that you would go to, um, I think that La Paz is unique. Cochabamba was very cool. Um, Santa Cruz, we enjoyed being there. Uh, but when you when you come to La Paz, I think... Uh, more than almost any other city I've been to, really anywhere. This is a city that stands out as unique. There's nothing quite like it that I've ever experienced. Of course, uh, I've only been to so many cities in South America, which is where it's most likely to have other ones uh, that share a lot of commonality with it. But um, being so high and, and having uh, so much mountainous terrain to deal with, really, I think, makes La Paz its own animal. I can't imagine how many places would be anything like this. Um, and it, so this is something worth noting in all of uh, Bolivia. You notice that the houses are really just 
brick colored in so many circumstances. There's very few uh, painted houses. And there's a reason for this. There is a tax when a house is finished. So when you paint a house and put a finishing outer coat on it, you pay a higher tax for that. So a, a really large number of people opt to simply not put that outer coat on their walls and leave exposed bricks, which of course does encourage more rapid wear and tear. I think it's a uh, not the best way to tax things because I think it reduces tax revenue precipitously while making the entire country brick colored, which is not best for anyone, I don't think. I'm not sure, maybe there's some ulterior motive, like they're trying to avoid the manufacturing of paints or something of that nature. Um, but uh, apart from something like that, I think that it, it does a detriment to a lot of things. And everybody talks about how everything is brick because no one wants to pay the taxes on having a painted house. So it's very strange, but that is why you see brick everywhere. It is not because people can't paint. It's not because there's some tradition of bricks. It's, it's purely, this is what a house avoiding paying unnecessary taxes looks like in this environment. It's a, it's a very strange situation indeed. This particular bit of the green line starts really high and we launch out over this massive drop off as we head to the next hill. It's really surprising. And as you take this, it really becomes obvious quickly just how isolated the far points of the green line must have been in the time before there was uh, the telepharic code. This is just outrageously remote if you were trying to come by road. It would take so long to drive out here. And we did at one point, and I think with no traffic, it took us easily 40 minutes in a taxi, rapidly driving, um, trying to get out there, maybe a little bit more, just to get to the end of the green line um, from a little bit closer than where we started, a few blocks closer. So figure 45 minutes um, in car, and here on the green line, we were able to do it with changing lines and everything a lot closer to 30, 35 minutes, which is not a ton closer, but no need to drive. Uh, could be done by someone who doesn't have a driver's license, could be done by a large group, by an individual um, in, in huge numbers quite easily. So it's, um, it's easy to see just how much this makes things simpler. And of all things, while driving in Bolivia is really uh, nerve wracking and stressful and difficult, um, even more so is just how hard the parking is both here in La Paz and in Cochabamba. But in Cochabamba, it was mostly only because of a limit of space, but here in La Paz, having to park on steep hills and start and stop and deal with these inclines and tight corners and tight little alleyways all over the place is just crazy. At the end of the green line, there is a number of food right outside, and we stopped to try some local delicacies that you can get right here at the Teleferico. So what's the name of this part of town? Uh, this is Zona Sur, um, Calacoto. Calacoto? Calacoto. All right, we're in Calacoto, which is in the south side of La Paz, and we have hawitas, which are often with meat. These are, um, I have one that's just cheese and one that's spicy cheese, like picante with, with hot sauce in it. And we have coffee. We just rode down on the, the, the Teleferico, which we're right at the green station at the end of the line so that we can try out something uh, unique. So this is kind of like street food at the uh, public transportation. Oh, that is yeah, really good. It's like a, it's like an empanada, but it's very light and fluffy. That is really good. After eating some really amazingly delicious empanada-like food, we set out to walk around a little bit in this southern part of the city. we got the river here. What we just saw behind us was actually the Ipico of the Armed Forces. It's the Armed Forces uh, College there in the city. Um, and this is one of the small rivers. All the rivers here are quite small, but we are in a drought, so it's hard to say uh, how big they usually are. Uh, so at this point, we're done with the Teleferico for the day. We actually did ride it back, but I didn't film any of that because it started getting dark. Uh, but I did take an opportunity while we were just out walking around to just get a little bit of this part of the city for you. So if you watched um, early in today's episode, but much more so in uh, yesterday's episode and the day before, we were walking through the old downtown, the much older part of the city, and you can see it immediately. 
here in this much newer uh, southeastern portion of the city, what I kind of think of as the green city or the city created by the existence of the green line, you'll notice immediately that everything is modern. Maybe not super modern, but like this building on our left, the retail has a modern feel. All of the high rises you see have very modern feels. These things all look like they've been built in the last 20 years and they really have been. So this is a completely different type of city even though we're still connected to downtown but remember how long we've been riding on the teleferico and we are still in high rises after all this distance and this is only a metro area of we're told about two and a half million people so that there are uh, high rises and things stretching on for these kinds of distances is uh, is really quite amazing You'll also notice that in this part of the city that uh, I wanted to grab that Kansas City Chicken uh, is a funny name for something to find uh, in the middle of La Paz. The roads here are wider. It's much easier to drive around this portion of the city than the other. That's all, uh, it's very different. It's, it's almost like two completely different places. And the elevation has gone down a little bit as well. Nothing significant, but... It is, it is slightly lower, and at times you will potentially feel it. You'll notice that even parking is easier, traffic is lighter. It's a, it's a totally different feel. You could be in another city. Our goal here is to walk to the Green Tower. This is a iconic structure, apparently, here in this part of uh, the city. And so it's, uh, there's a lot of really big buildings here, but it does seem to stand out. It must be the tallest one uh, in this particular area. And I think you can kind of see it there in front of us. Uh, Marcelo really wanted to uh, take me up there so that I could kind just kind of see. They have like a fancy restaurant and some stuff. And there's a lot of really nice uh, eateries and shopping areas in this part of town. Obviously, it feels much more Western, much more North American uh, because of the modernity and be just because of the way they've approached a lot of things. Thing. So it's um, in, in old La Paz, I think it feels much more Latin American. And out here, they've had space to kind of sprawl a little bit and, and don't have that compression and don't have those old, old businesses. So, so more modern takes on things have kind of uh, worked their way in. So it feels so incredibly different. It was nice that we got to walk around out here. And, and honestly, this is, remember, three videos I did all in my first day. I get distracted a lot as I'm telling the story because I have to do it from the video. It's so much easier when I'm walking and talking with the camera because then I'm telling you about the things that I'm seeing and I'm pausing and pointing in real time and narrating as a voiceover is actually quite difficult, but it's just the way I have to do it sometimes. And um, so I get distracted and don't finish what I'm saying. But the last three days have all been filmed on my very first day here in La Paz, which I had set aside as a day to be sick and I had no plans to do anything, not to work, not to film, nothing. And being able to get out and do three days and see so much of the city when I thought I was going to be down sick is just fantastic. So I'm very happy with how that turned out. That's the Green Tower there. You can't miss it in front of us. Uh, and if you're looking on a map, just do a search on Google Maps for Green Tower. I don't even think you have to type in La Paz. It's like the only place in the world actually called the Green Tower. Um, it's very funny. Uh, and you can see some flickering. Remember that my camera is set for 60 hertz uh, and all the electric here is 50 hertz. So when you see things lit by electric lights, they're often flickering. That's what's, that's what's going on there. It does not flicker when you're standing there in person. And uh, so I, I'm so happy that we did, we did so many miles. This was easily a seven to nine mile day of walking, plus just out and about, uh, going out for meals, uh, actively doing things, and it felt so good even at the end of the day. Now, when we were done at the Green Tower, admittedly, I was huffing and puffing a little bit, and uh, I was not walking as fast as I normally would, but I felt pretty good and we were able to just keep walking and walking and at no point, whether on this day or in subsequent days, did I ever feel sick or have a headache or anything of that nature. Big risk, do not just go to altitude and do this. You have to know yourself and be really, really careful, but it is, um, 
is really amazing to me, like how good I ended up feeling. And remember, I did take several days in Cochabamba. I have been very carefully uh, taking the medicine and everything for this, but those things did work. And I am walking slowly. I'm being very aware of my breathing. I'm making sure I'm getting more air than I usually would or more breath than I normally would. Um, I'm paying attention to if I'm starting to feel run down, I take pauses. So I was being very careful uh, within reason, but I was not going to, when I was feeling so well, uh, stop and skip um, seeing the city. There's just, This was my one chance to see so much of it. And I'm really glad that I did because we got so much good footage on this day and good exercise too. Um, and it was great. And one of the things that makes me really happy, now we, we end up going to dinner in that place I just showed you in two nights, um, that uh, I now know I can return to La Paz very easily uh, and spend time there, which I was concerned about. I was concerned I was going to come up, be sick, and, and find that it's just a destination that I can't realistically go to because it's just too difficult or I would be sick for too long. Because if you're going to be sick for two or three days, it can turn what would be normal travel into uh, something that's really painful and unpleasant. And of course, a lot of people travel to La Paz. It's a, it's a popular destination within reason. Um, and, and they're able to do so. It's not a big deal. So it's not like most people get exceptionally sick, but most people do have some downtime. And everyone we talk to from Cochabamba is like, no, when we go up to La Paz, we have a day of downtime before we're able to do anything. Um, so I was very, very pleasantly surprised uh, by my own experiences here. We're coming up on the Green Tower. You can see it getting closer. And uh, as we're walking, I'll take this moment to uh, remind you, if you'd like to help support the channel, of course, that is so appreciated. It makes such a big difference uh, that makes us able to do trips like this and have the cameras and film and take the time to upload these, like just this trip, 40 minutes in the Teleferico. That takes, you know, hours to record and then hours to edit and, and overdub and everything. There's a lot of work to get these episodes out, which I love doing and I'm so appreciative uh, that I have such a great audience and, and so many awesome people who live in my little GoPro box that uh, share these journeys with me and are excited to come out and uh, explore the world with me. It makes it, I feel so much more connected to everybody going on these trips. I'm all by myself on this particular trip. I mean, obviously Marcelo is walking with me, but I was alone in a hotel room for the majority of the time that I was in Bolivia. And uh, knowing that you guys were looking forward to the updates and along for the ride and, and part of that journey uh, really does make it uh, a lot more exciting. I love that there is a star directly above uh, the the building there. That was really cool. Uh, or probably the moon. I, I didn't really catch what it was. Something something up there uh, that was so far away in the GoPro. And uh, you can see the sun getting low here as we start walking back. But if you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at the link I'll put on the screen, buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That is uh, similar to Patreon. It comes directly to me when you, when you buy coffees that shows up in my bank account account later that day and uh, really does help make this this possible. I, I have to carry a lot of cameras and a lot of SD cards and I have to have a laptop and hard drives and it really does take a lot uh, just to get this out. And for those who have followed along for a long time, you know that we're pumping out really long episodes every single day and uh, that's exhausting. Um, on a technology basis, on a financial basis, and on a personal basis. But um, I love that we're able to do this. I love that th this isn't a connection we do once a week. This is something we do every day. And uh, there we're back at the place that we're going to have dinner with the team in two nights. You can just see it off to the right there. And I'll just mention the food was amazing. It was so good. And it was so much fun taking the whole team out while we were there. I was so grateful that we got a chance uh, to come out and, and do so much with the, the teams everywhere. It was This was a really valuable trip. Obviously, the travel stuff that I'm showing you guys, fantastic. I love getting to explore new places in Bolivia. was fantastic. But being able to bring the team out and get times with the, the employees that I work with every day uh, for the first time because we, you know, COVID really made it that we couldn't travel and couldn't see each other. So this is really important. There's, and then there was several people that were hired on this trip. Um, so we were meeting people who had just come on board. Uh, one was hired on this day, one was hired on the day before, and one is going to be hired tomorrow. Uh, so all in Bolivia. So it was very interesting to have all that come together. And only one of all those people did we not manage uh, to meet up with while we were doing you know, this this time in Bolivia. So there's one person we missed that was hired in Cochabamba as we flew out. Uh, but everyone else here in La Paz was able to get together for dinner uh, coming up 
uh, in a day or two. So this has been great. Remember to like and subscribe. Uh, that really, you know, it, we say that everyone says that, but um, it really does make a difference. Like that stuff gets the channel in front of YouTube and lets them know that this is something you like. And uh, if you want to make a huge difference um, without donating money or both, of course, um, just when this, when this episode is over, go on to another one. And you don't have to necessarily watch it. Obviously, it's better if you watch it. It's even better if you leave a comment down below. Absolutely do that as well for everyone. Even if you're just saying hi, uh, or you're saying you like this footage or you don't, you like the voiceovers, you like it better when I'm walking around, whatever. Sometimes I can't help it, right? I can't avoid these all the time. But um, get down and say hi to ask questions, uh, leave comments. That stuff really does make a difference. And watch that extra episode. And when you're away from your computer, you're gonna go do something, oh, just put one on in the background. Put it on your TV with the YouTube app on your on your smart television, or even watch it on your phone while you're on the, the bus or whatever in the train. Those things add up and YouTube really pays attention to, ooh, this isn't just a show they watch every day, they watch old episodes or whatever. So thanks so much for joining me. Uh, tell your friends and family, share this with other people uh, and help us get out and do more more of this and I will see all of you tomorrow.